OK, so we've got this main sequence fitting method. It has its problems, but then everything has its problems. Uh, can we just go and use it to other more distant galaxies further away than the Magellanic Clouds? Unfortunately, Paul, stars are faint. And so even if we go to the Andromeda spiral, a star like our Sun, which is sort of at the upper end of that main sequence, is so faint that although you can barely detect it with the Hubble Space Telescope, the problem is, is it's going to be confused with other stars that are right next to it. And so you just sort of get a blurry mess. And so you really can't do it even to the nearest big galaxy, the Andromeda spiral. So we need a third step in the distance ladder. We need something that's brighter than main sequence stars, like a giant star. Uh, and we need these things to be common enough that we can find some of them in the Magellanic clouds so we can use it to calibrate the system. And preferably really easy to identify. And luckily there are such stars, Cepheid variables, which mm. is an example. Very pretty star. Now these are giant stars, so they're nice and bright and you can see them out to much greater distances. Uh, what, what makes them really interesting is their pulse. Mm. So that makes now, them easy to find. Yes, so what happens identify. is they've got a layer in the atmosphere which is doubly ionized helium which turns out to be almost completely opaque to the heat coming out from inside. So the heat inside can't get out through this layer, and so it builds up, and it builds up. And of course, if you get gas and you make it hotter and hotter and hotter, its pressure's going to go up. Pressure outside isn't going to change, so the pressure gradient's going to get steeper, which is going to push things out, just like a piston in a steam engine. So it's the whole thing's going to puff up like a giant balloon that you're essentially building up heat in, yeah? Yes, so it'll expand outwards. But as it expands outwards, it's doing work. A force times distance is work. Yep. Um, so energy is going into work against potential energy, and that's going to cause this helium layer to cool down. Ah, and then it won't be doubly ionized, I bet. Yeah, when it gets cool enough, it'll stop being doubly ionized. It'll be like opening the blinds on a window. The radiation can now escape. Ooh, and so suddenly all the radiation will escape, and so the thing will be bright, but it will cool down rapidly, which means it's going to want to collect and contract. Yes, so it'll shrink back down again, and as it shrinks, of course, that gravitational potential energy is turning back into yeah. heat, and so it'll start warming up. And then you'll double ionize helium again, and it'll start trapping all the light again. So it'll be faint, but heating up. Yes. So you seem to going to get this big pulsating star. That's right. And what's really useful about the things, firstly, they're easy to spot because yeah. they pulse. So you, what you do is you take lots of pictures over and over again and look for giant stars that change in brightness. And there's a very particular sawtooth pattern they show which shows how they change in brightness. But then, even more interesting, is what's called the Levitt Law, worked out by Henrietta Swan Levitt uh, back in the early 20th century. And what she found is that if you look at the pulsation period and you look at the absolute magnitude, which is telling you the luminosity, how bright they really are, there's a correlation between the two. It sort of makes sense when you think about it because big stars burn their hydrogen or all their nuclear uh, fuel more quickly, so they're brighter. And if you think about that whole process of that pulsation, it's going to depend on how big and extended the star is and how much gravity it has. So you can imagine it would depend on the uh, the mass of the star, and indeed they sort of, these resonances depend on the mass and they ring like giant bells effectively. And the period is uh, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, up to 80 days or so, so that's a quite measurable period. And at the optical wavelengths, this is optical wavelengths, it's not that good a correlation, there's a fair bit of scatter. If you go up to infrared wavelengths, it gets really quite tight, quite a nice correlation. So. This looks pretty straightforward. What you do is we start off by calibrating this in the Large Magellanic Cloud. There are lots of Cepheid variables there. Yep. And we know how far away it is because of the main sequence fitting. And so we get these plots. And that's actually where this plot came from. And then that tells us if we see something pure with a given pulse, what its luminosity is. And then you go look at a more distant galaxy. And you find some things of the same pulse period. And we once again use the inverse square law. We use the ratio of the fluxes. And that gives us the distance. So easy. All solved. Yeah, there are a couple issues, Paul. So one thing you will notice is they do have a lot of scatter down here in the optical wavelengths. And so if you go, let's look at that picture of a Cepheid. One of the reasons it's such a pretty object is there's a lot of junk around that. And that stuff's scattering the light of that star. And so that junk is going to, we don't know how much, normally you can't see all that junk. So you don't really know how much junk there is. And so that junk, that dust, will affect how bright they appear. Now you can get around that in the infrared, as we've seen, because pretty much in the infrared, 
there's not a lot of scattering. But there's a few problems with Cepheids in the infrared. One, it's really hard to observe in the infrared. And it turns out they don't pulse much in the infrared. So they're very hard to identify in the infrared. You have to have really good quality data. Or what we normally do is we find them in the optical and then observe them in the infrared knowing what they are. But even so, once again, as stars, how much metals they have in their atmospheres is really going to determine how bright they are in detail. And once again, the Large Magellanic Cloud has less metals than normal other galaxies. So there's a correction we're going to have to make for it. No one knows what this correction is. I mean, there's a lot of controversy over whether the Cepheids with more heavy elements are brighter or fainter than the ones with less heavy elements for a given period. No one really knows. Well, we've sort of, we've, we've made lots of observations, and I would say it's very uncertain. And people are prepared. Some people say it's almost no problem, and some people say there's quite a big effect. And so that is a problem that's going to be uh, saddled with these stars, which at some level are considered by many astronomers as the panacea uh, to our distance measuring uh, problems in astronomy. So you can use it to measure the distance to a galaxy like this one. And so this is the Andromeda spiral. And uh, Hubble actually found a Cepheid in this in 1923. And so that was one of the first galaxies where they realized they were a long ways away using the same technique. Though actually the answer I got was quite wrong, first of all, because the calibrators using earlier distance scale used were incorrect. And secondly, there are two different types of Cepheids and they get confused. So it is true. But on the other hand, they at the time, many people thought these were in the galaxy, and he realized they were a thousand times further away. So that was, he got it, got it to within an order of magnitude, yeah, which, which was quite good enough for, to... Yeah, it was good for astronomy. Uh, now, can we then go and use Cepheids all the way out to the edge of the universe to measure the expansion of space? So, unfortunately, no. Uh, with ground-based telescopes, it's pretty easy now to find Cepheids in this star. We could do it in this 19... Galaxy, yep. uh, sorry, in this galaxy. And we could do it in 1923. But if we want to go out let's say 10 times further than this, which is still only 7 megaparsecs, really nearby part of the universe, then the objects are going to be 100 times fainter. And that turns about to be about what you can do with a modern 8-meter telescope in a really good site, is you can sort of go out another factor of 10 than this. But that's still not very far. That's just in the... It's only halfway to the Virgo cluster. That's right. And so the galaxies are going to be very much affected by their motions due to gravity at that distance. Okay. So what's actually being used is yet another step in the distance study. You use Cepheids to get out to maybe six or seven megaparsecs. And within that radius, you find a fair number of galaxies. Not that many, but there's a some dozens of galaxies in that sort of radius. And then you look at some... You Now you're going to use galaxies themselves as a the next rung of the distance ladder, and there are various things you can do about it. One of the most widespread is what's called the Tully-Fisher relation. What you do is you measure how rapidly the galaxy is rotating, and it turns out that correlates with the brightness. So let's look at the black points here, which are the spiral galaxies. What you can find is, if you look at how rapidly they rotate here, that correlates with their true brightness. Once again, calibrated by these nearby galaxies where you can get Cepheid distances. It's different for other sorts of galaxies, but just consider the spirals for the moment. And there, there's a correlation there. So well, there should be a correlation. If these things are rotating, it's just like measuring the mass of the sun with the motion of Neptune, right? Well, yes and no. It's telling you that the, the mass, which depends mainly on the dark matter, correlates with the light, which depends ah. mainly on the stars. Yeah, that dark matter stuff. Ooh. Yeah, so it's actually kind of interesting because it's telling us that there's a correlation between the dark matter and the luminous matter, which wouldn't be obvious given we don't know what the dark matter is. But on the other hand, at least we can use this pretty much anywhere we see a spiral galaxy. But it doesn't look very accurate. Yeah, there's an awful lot of scatter around it. Yeah, so that is going to be a problem because this doesn't tell us how many kilometers away a galaxy is. It tells us this galaxy is that much further than that galaxy. So it's a relative distance. So we are going to have to calibrate it very accurately. And presumably we're going to want to use Cepheids to do that. But there are not very many galaxies we can measure Cepheids for. And that scatter is going to mean it's going to be tough to really pin down the distances accurately. Yes, if we want to look at some distant redshift, we can find millions of galaxies and measure it so we can get very accurate law out there, but we have to calibrate it against the nearby ones. We just can't see far enough to get enough points to calibrate it very well. Yeah, so it turns out I believe that the scatter for this method is about 18% per distance. Which is a killer. Yeah. Oh, well. 
Ah, then there's type 1a supernovae. I like type 1a supernovae. Yes, now we've talked about these already in uh, previous courses. We talked about them for distance scale in course one, and we talked about the physics behind them in the Violet Universe course. But for those who haven't done those previous courses, Brian, do you want to remind us what they are and why they are so wonderful? So type 1a supernovae uh, are some of the largest explosions uh, in our universe, and we're pretty sure that they result when a white dwarf, a degenerate ball of electrons effectively, uh, reach a point where that whole ball ignites uh, and converts the carbon and oxygen in the white dwarf to things like uh, nickel and cobalt and iron. And that produces a huge ball of expanding um, junk that is incredibly bright, about five billion times brighter than our sun. And the process that creates this seems to always produce more or less the same thing. If you ignite a ball of degenerate electrons, you almost always get more or less the same thing. So you can measure distances with these, uh, these objects that are very bright, to about 6 or 7 percent. And that's a lot better than 18 percent, it turns out. But the main problem with these, my turn to say that now, mm. is that there aren't that many nearby type 1a supernovae that you can calibrate. So while it's very good for relative distances of one supernova against another, they're just such rare events that uh, there aren't that many of them that have come happened close enough in recent historical times when you've had good telescopes to observe them that we can actually calibrate out the distances very accurately. So it's like once again the near calibration, we presumably have to use Cepheids or Tully Fisher or something like that to work out how far away the nearby ones are, use that to set the luminosity and then you can use them as a yard arm across the entire universe. Yeah, so yeah, unfortunately the last one in the Milky Way was 400 years ago. The last one in the Large Magellanic Cloud we think was about a thousand years ago. We're not really sure, we just see the remnant. We've never seen one in the Andromeda Spiral. Indeed, we had one of the closest ones in living memory uh, earlier this year, which was about four megaparsecs away, but it was enveloped in a bunch of dust, so we couldn't actually use it to measure distances. So they, are, they, they do have their own little problems.